Hi, hello, Narendra. Yeah. How are you? It's happy birthday. Happy, thank you so much, and that's very nice of you to re remember the date. This is a pleasant surprise. Very, very nice, you know, day. We just happened to. Remarkable. Uh, thank you. The election for the president of the United States. Yeah. And, um, also in India, as you know, this is the day of Karwa Chot. Well, we 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 are also, but the, my wife is also fasting as well. <laughs> it's the same. Yeah, right. Uh, I, I told this morning, uh, and uh, she said, "Well, um, uh, he, he, Narendra's wife will be very upset because uh, she must be really breaking the fast at this time, uh, around this time." I don't know what's the predicted uh, moon uh, yeah. being time at least today. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. So how are you? I'm doing fine. Yes, I you know nowadays most of the things I do from home. So yeah. I have a staff in an office at home. One of the rooms upstairs I have converted into my office. So I don't go anymore to the inn, you know, because of the COVID. So eventually, I even left that office because you know there's no point in maintaining an office over there, and because I'm not going there. Hmm. Well, I'm same same here. I think we, we I mean, I, I retired from clinical duties. Uh, oh, I see. I've got a lot of active academic activities. Uh, last year, I joined a um, Bars and London Medical School, um, which is which is part of the Queen Mary University of London. So they gave me only chair there. I've got, uh -huh. I've got I maintain links here also. So I mean, many things which I'm really involved. That's and, very good. Uh, so um, you may remember I mentioned that I've set up a foundation called the Genomic Medicine Foundation. Yes, you told me that about that. Yeah. yeah. So within that foundation, we are developing a, a faculty of uh, oh. distinguished. Uh, uh, people all over the world. Uh, so part of that, we are uh, recording and um, their profile in person, not just by by having a bio sketch, you know, in the, like a CV or bio sketch, a few papers. So it's just like a informal chat, you know, and that will be part of the portfolio, which will be on the website and also I think. Uh, we do have a YouTube also account, so yeah. on that. So um, you you are the first person actually. I mean, I've, I've invited um, oh, uh, a few people in India, and um, so they will follow you. Have you included me as a part of the faculty of your foundation? Yes. <laughs> you are. This is something like I have in the last actually. You know, ever since I retired, officially superannuated, I should say, from the duties of AIMS, which we do at the age 65. And as you know, I was, and that was the end of 2014. And I was uh, the dean of the institute at that time. Yeah. The, then I had a lot of options either to go totally to the private sector, where they were offering me a huge amount of money because of my expertise in organ transplant. Uh, you know, and I got scared. I don't want that kind of a money, you know, because when somebody pays you that huge money, they will also ask you, what What have you done? Have you got <laughs> that kind of money or not? So I, the, the, the ICMR, the Indian Council of Medical Research, created for me a national chair. So that was the first time that they created the chair and I was the first one to join with my office in, May, in AIMS. So I was the national chair for five years. And that also I finished. That, yes. And then they offered me, they gave me the uh, ICMR emeritus scientist. And they picked something in that. Then I think due to COVID, um, since I was working all the time from home, and even there was, a, there was a call from the prime minister's office that why don't we decrease the expenditure, this and that. So I, I thought I will not take any. So I'm honorary ICMR. Uh, you know, I'm a writer, scientist, taking yeah. nothing, no penny from them. <laughs> <laughs> I can. My, my, these roles are also on really. I mean, I do have my a small private practice, which uh, which is called Genome Clinic uh, UK Limited. So, yeah. which is I get I get some extra work. So I'm I'm busy in myself. Uh, actually, within, I... uh, within this foundation, um, 
uh, this uh, faculty would be part of the academy actually. Mm -hmm. The history to give you some idea. The, the foundation basically myself and uh, you will remember famous man uh, here, Sir David Weatherall. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So oh, who, who? I mean, sure. Teresina tell, person. Mm -hmm. I think he was a person who really cloned many genes for Peter Thalassemia. And right. his, uh, his colleague, uh, Doug, Doug Hicks, uh, um, developed alpha thalassemia. So, that, so, so he was very keen on uh, genomic medicine. So we started his foundation. Last year he passed away. He was patron of the foundation. So coming back to this um, pro program now, what we, we are now talking today. It's a really an informal, um, like a going back or, you know, uh, yeah, the person, you know how, how did the person start, you know? So just, uh, so just yeah. take, take us through what, uh, how did you come to genetics or the transplantation or HLA? Oh, I think I would recommend in because, you know, in Odisha, in Katak, there is a very famous college called Ravenshaw College. So much so that most of the, you know, the IAS and the big people, do, it is still in the British time. It's about 200 years old college. And the college has now been made into university, Devonshire University. Hmm. They had invited me, I think two years ago, to give a lecture like this and trace your own life history. So become like a, you know, <laughs> uh, let the other people know. So I... Uh, how how did you come to this? So so I had fortunately those kind of slides which I had made at the time. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a very good idea about what you are doing. Just uh, tell me, Render, about um, uh, your early early life, uh, if you don't mind. You know, just uh, yeah. give us some. So idea. Was, I was born in Amritsar, mm -hmm. and uh, really in the heart of Amritsar. My house was just behind the Golden Temple, the famous. So I have grown listening to the Gurbani, of, uh, which was from Golden Temple, wonderful area, uh, surrounded by temples. My street was surrounded by temples, Hanuman Temple, Shivji Temple. So any the kind of upbringing that you had, yeah. uh, you were surrounded by <laughs> these gods and where all kinds of functions take place. But there's nothing to beat the Golden Temple. And of course, I used to spend a lot of childhood going to the Golden Temple. And I do remember the school that I had gone to was the BK Higher Secondary School. And I used to walk from my home. It used to be about half an hour walk or so from my home to the school. And on the way, there was a crossing where there was a statue of the Queen. And this particular chalk was called as Malka Bhut. Bhut means a statue. Mamalka means the queen. So queen's statue. And I have seen that as a child. <laughs> of course, it was then brought down. And uh, now, of course, uh, Amrasar is queen, queen Victoria. Queen Victoria. So now, of course, everything is changed. That's why I used to pass, uh, you know, pass that and go to my school and my schooling. For example, and there, of course, I joined the school, that, that higher secondary school. We used to call higher secondary at that time uh, from class five. Because of class one to four, you were in a pre in, in a sort of prep school, which was just next door to my house. And we started learning English only from class seven or eight onwards. Mm, class seven. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, and you know, I do remember in class eight, they used, this was called the middle school in the middle school there used to be exam the state exam you know the uh, the district amrasar the district exam and the headmaster of the school used to give us essay to write in english of course we had just started learning english hmm. you know i had i had i don't know god's gift of uh, of writing good english even at that time right from eighth class so i stood first and the headmaster go around and I was very short in height and he used to call the Chotu, you know, look at the Chotu, you know, he wrote a very good uh, essay. <laughs> I kind of essay. Mm -hmm. And of course I got the, that was the class when I got my first scholarship. Mm -hmm. And this 
scholarship was what? This was class eight and uh, I'm born of course in 1949. So um, class eight, I would be about 12, 13 years of age, 13 years of age perhaps. And uh, they gave me a scholarship for six rupees a month. <laughs> and, my, and my fee, school fee was waived off. It used to be a few annas. Of course, my father said, no, no, I, I think we will pay the fee. There's no problem. We, I can pay the fee. Mm -hmm. So I, I remember they gave me the next three years of my scholarship money. Six rupees per month will be 72 into three. So that's the kind of money that I got myself. First time you know, in cash and used to be really bumper money at that time. <laughs> yeah, so that, that, yeah. I, that was my first, uh, you know, exposure to a competitive fellowship and com competitive sort of class. Yes. And um, my colleagues were mostly inclined to do engineering, but you know, I wanted to do m medical. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, there was nobody to guide in my home. I must tell you that my I, we have four brothers and one sister. And sister, of course, the eldest amongst the brothers, I'm number three. And none of my brothers went beyond uh, class 12 or something. Mm -hmm. But I had like a beginning and sort of inclination to read and study. So much so that my brothers would go around playing in the street or here and there. Uh, I would go to the topmost uh, floor of my house and sit somewhere in the corner and, and, and sort of keep studying. So that was my the beginning. And of course, my childhood in Amritsar, I have seen destructive colonies. This was right after the partition. So, you know, this was also the case in Lahore, for example. So a lot of destructed colonies, which were... Hmm. Muslim colonies may be Indian side and there would be similarly Hindu colonies on the Punt and all that. So we used to have all those areas, open areas. And if, uh, as children, we thought it is open areas for us to play. But that was actually the historical background is that they were actually burnt areas or degraded and uh, broken because those people left the houses and things of that sort. But because that, that's what I learned from my grandma and my mother, that these are areas all where Muslim colonies were there and they were destroyed. During partition, it happened. Yeah, partition. And I, I did have the opportunity again also to go in 1999 to Lahore because, you know, when I grew up as a child, the whole of Amritsar used to talk about Lahore. Yeah. Lahore was the most famous town of North India because you know the medical people the medical college of Lahore was the best college at that time yes. I think there were only two colleges Lahore Medical College and the King George Lucknow oh, yes. so, and you know uh, Ames was built in 1956 so I would say 70% plus faculty was from Amritsar which had come from Lahore yes so, Amritsar and then they went over there and then all the tandems of course came from um, Lucknow. Yes. So these two colleges were because of which the whole Ames was built. And I had no idea that when I was growing I, had no, I only knew there is an Amritsar Medical College. So you know and I was fascinated by students of the medical college because they used to wear a red red blazer actually and move around you know. <laughs> That was a big fascination for me, and I didn't. Uh, so I I managed to go there. So you know, of course, class eleven. We in the school, you are only up to class eleven. Class twelve, which was called as the pre medical, mm -hmm. I did from the DAV school, DAV college, DAV college, Amritsar. That's the only class, one class I was there. But that was in 1965, and that's the time when the war happened. You know, the India Pakistan war happened. War, yes. Yes. And the one other thing that I remember that the principal of the college uh, gave a speech. His name was the Dr. C. L. Arora. He was the professor of physics. A very motivating speech he gave. Look, we are at war and there are, there are some uh, 
you know, the soldiers uh, from Pakistan who might have been dropped uh, through, uh, you know, the, um, <laughs> the parachute. yeah, the parachutes. So you should be careful. And also you should be careful because some of the soldiers are moving around in the town in the disguise of beggars. Mm. The students were motivated and we were, our college was closed for two weeks. Mm. And we all, I do remember when we came out of the college, the children, we were all children, about 16, 17 years of age. <laughs> we were beating any beggar that we meet on the way. <laughs> Very unfortunate. Very unfortunate. And the beggar would say that I have been doing this for years over here, but you know, people. <laughs> and then, of course, they, uh, the college going students were uh, put on duty by the NCC that you are to give duty in the night so that nobody switches on the lights. So there used to be blackouts because of those, you know, the air, 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 air strikes. So we were on duty. So those are the things that I remember from those days. And then of course I was in the medical college. Yeah, and then straight from there I came to Ames. I had no idea even at that time what Ames is because Ames in Amritsar used to be referred to as the American hospital. I don't know why the common people would call it that there is an American hospital in Delhi. Oh, a lot of faculty had come from outside also, had come from US also, and many of them had the the foreign wives, the you know the Caucasian wives. So maybe some people must have gone over there, then I must have seen some people. And I also when I went for the first time, I also when I was moving around in the campus, I did see. Uh, these foreign women, and these were the wives of some of our seniors, and uh, and so that's how I, I had never dreamt in my dreams that Which I become. Did you go to Ames. Uh, so right after the seventy end of seventy, I was right in Ames. So you did uh, stay from passing uh, MBBS. Yes, I I stayed from medical college. I went to straight over there, and I could, could get the admission there, and of course. You know, the, uh, they were giving a scholarship to us to do masters. A scholarship used to be rupees 300 per month, and that was a royal money at the time because our mess bill used to be only 60, 70 bucks. Mm. Uh, um, and, uh, and then it was increased from 300 to 330 rupees. Mm. So that was one other attraction, you know. I, I don't think, I, I mean, I, I didn't belong to a very rich family. It was a I would say low middle class family and if you can now sustain yourself and do even the master so it was very, very good so mm. I, I, I came over and then I stayed in Ames and I I don't know how I wanted to I was very attracted to basic sciences so I joined as a master's course in um, anatomy human anatomy and it is at that time in 1972 uh, or 1971, I must say. Uh, 1971, uh, the Ames, one of the faculty members in pathology, organized a workshop on, uh, uh, you know, the mice and exchange of skin grafts in mice. And how do you maintain uh, the mice? Or how do you, what are inbred mice? And there was this teacher, Barbara Heslop, she came from Dunedin, New Zealand. And she was teaching us how to exchange skin grafts in mice. And what is the purpose of doing that? If you exchange skin grafts uh, between inbred strains of mouse, the skin graft will be accepted. And outbred, inbred mice, outbred mice, and all go, and the different strains. Something that I learned for the first time. But I must say, Davin, that even now when I go to various institutions to interview uh, young students, many of them don't know the meaning of the word inbred mice. Really? But, uh, yeah, I mean, they, 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 they're working in animals. And I say, are, the, are your animals inbred or outbred? <laughs> Outbreath. Oh, I 
and you uh, you are showing me in breath and they, and and do you know the meaning of the word syngenic no so you know i think my generation because i then i got so interested in this and my boss imported four pairs of cbmis from jackson labs mm. and and we had to we had to breed them and i did all that you know from four pairs and then i after i masters i i i joined my phd as well i thought i should do it immediately and then i could go for a postdoc so during the phd my subject was uh, uh looking at the uh, immune uh, immunity in leprosy leprosy used to be in this early 70s was the major infectious disease in india yes. you know there were total about 10 to 12 million cases around the world but 5 to 7 millions were in india oh really mm. oh yeah and now of course it's all gone so 5 to 7 million cases were in india mm. and you have all that spectrum from tuberculosis tt type or from one end of the spectrum to leprosy and leprosy and from the on the other end of the spectrum and uh, if i can also start sharing my slides with you yeah uh, that actually help to explain even more uh let's see if i can share host disabled attendee screen sharing i think you have to allow me to do my screen sharing uh he says that... he says host disabled attendee screen sharing okay is it happening now uh Yes, I think. Can you see it, my slide? Uh, it should come soon. Yeah, I mean, I have allowed multiple participants can share simultaneously. Open system preferences. Yeah, I think it's, it's from my end. It is allowed. Is allowed? Yeah. Let me then again try. uh i have this slide with me uh should say share he says allow zoom to share your screen and i would say yes open system and is is it zoom right yeah zoom. Zoom. uh what do i do firewall no privacy why is it not being shared you have to go to just share share a screen option yeah i go i go to the screen share option yeah i think should come now yes it is here now yes do you see this yeah yes you can now start playing now as a slide yeah, can you see my slide which i which is uh, my journey into the world of science of hla yeah that's correct yeah that's a title yes uh all right and let me make it full yeah is it okay? yes it's visible so i was just talking to you my journey into the world of science of hla yeah that's it, that's the main uh, information i need you know from you because you are the pioneer of hla in india that time i'm talking of 71 72 you remember that the banasrabs work Baruj Banasra, who got the Nobel Prize on immune response genes, his work was actually of 1972, and of course the MSC, the major compatibility complex, the MSC and uh, the HLA system, uh, it was due to the work done in 1958 by Dosse in France, uh, Jan van Roo in Holland, and Rose Payne in the US, and these were the pioneers, and. Uh, <clears throat> and of course the earlier work by um, uh, uh peter um, uh, uh, let me see the name will come 
So these three people were then given the Nobel Prize in 1980. So I was starting right at the time when people around the world were starting. But yeah. my question was, nobody in India knew this. No, there was nobody in India. So I was struggling. So this Babala Heslop, when she showed, I, I must have that inclination me in me of becoming a surgeon. But, you know, rather than a human surgeon, I became a mouse surgeon. Mm -hmm. I started doing a lot of skin skin graft exchanges in the mouse and I could do so very well that Barbara Heslop said, oh, you're doing so well. And I went on to do thymectomy in the mice, uh, thoracic duct cannulation in the mice because I wanted to look at the T-cells and their role in leprosy. So I created a leprosy mouse model. So this was early 70s. Uh, as a PhD student, I was in the department of immunology of leprosy in the experimental mouse model. My, this was my CBA inbred strain that I got from Jackson and I, I bred them and so much. It took me about two years to breed them and I had a colony okay. and I loved all my lab in Maine. Oh yeah, uh, Jackson, Maine. Yeah. And I learned so much the, you know, the cannibalism and oh, so much. What, what is exactly the meaning of uh, and how do you create a syngenic strain? Because, you know, you, you, you breed them for 15 to 20 generations, uh, brother, sister, may, mating. So this is my beginning in that time. But what was happening was, this was what I was doing in mouse model uh, to look into uh, the role of immune response there. We wanted to understand that time, by the time the, uh, the, the information on T and B cells T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes have become known. So we wanted to understand the cell mediated versus humoral immunity in these mice, which was something we found in man. But then in 1974 or so, I, my boss sent me to this uh, place, central part of India. You remember Varda? This is near Nagpur. Yeah. I know the name, but I've never been there. In Sevagram where Mahatma Gandhi spent more than 10 years over there. Well, you know, leprosy, leprosy, um, leprosy. leprosy was so rampant and over there that there are villages where almost every household would have that. You know, And I was flabbergasted by lo looking over there because my purpose at that time was to go and see the patients of leprosy maybe uh, because I, uh, you know, I wanted to do some study now on genetics. You know, genetics was uh, inter uh, uh, making interest in my mind because there, when I saw the families, there were families where there were seven, eight children, and maybe one or two or three would develop leprosy, not others, and they're all living in uh, in a hut, in a single a single room hut. <coughs> all living in the, the same environment, eating the same amount of food, and even sharing clothes and all that, but yet only two or three would develop, others will not. So that gave an inclination to us that there must be a role of genetics there. Mm. This is what I wanted to then study. Yes. As, a, as a side part of my PhD work, which was basically on understanding the immunity, here we were then looking into this. So for this, <clears throat> and, you know, on my immunity work, I had to really uh, have a big colony of this uh, inbred mice, used to do thymectomy. I got so much of trained in doing thymectomy of this mice at four to six weeks of age. I must tell you here a very important story. In uh, Mill Hill in UK, National Institute of Medical Research, and I'm MRC, MRC Center. The word has spread that there's an Indian boy who is so much of adept in doing thymectomy in the mice. So they had actually invited me and I went and spent about two to three months time. That was in 76 after I had finished my PhD also. I was looking for a place to go. So they invited me. So I went there for two, three months. And, uh, and not only to NIMR, but also to Oxford because in Oxford, uh, Eter Morris group, very famous Eter Morris group, that was a transplant group. You know, they were 
they were doing even at that time kidney transplants and more importantly they were interested in pancreatic transplants as well at that time and peter morris was a great guy he was uh, absolutely fantastic and similar was the case in um, mill hill uh, dr reese uh, dick reese is, was his name and i showed them the group as a whole how to do thymectomy in the adult mice at four to six weeks of age. <laughs> you know, being an anatomist, I knew exactly where to make a cut and all that. So, you know, I could, within moments, I could be a matter of within minutes, you can remove these two thymus lobes and uh, the mouse will not die. Because our plan at that time was to have immunocompromised mouse. <clears throat> that that I would have to give the bone marrow reconstitution because otherwise the mouse will die because we give them total body irradiation. So that was the study that I was doing at that time. Thymactomized mouse, make him, give him total body irradiation, 900 rats, which was a lethal dose for the mice. And unless I give the bone marrow reconstitution, they will die. And the bone marrow has to come from an inbred mouse. And there was a need for that. Mm -hmm. And then I do the M. leprae inoculation and the foot, foot pad. So it was the immunocompromised mouse in which you give this. And then the, uh, the mouse would develop a leprosy. And that, that was my mouse model. I think it made waves all over the world. And of course, my uh, teacher, my boss, he had already spent about two years in, uh, in Oxford and Oxford group and the NMIR group were, were in collaboration and from there they had learned and I practiced from him and, and then I became an expert <laughs> so much so that I was invited to show I make to meet them. So that was my early, uh, you know, you can say that I became a mouse doctor more uh, the MD of the mouse, mouse, mouse doctor. but I must have done thousands of okay. times. Mm. Oh, so so he, he, just for inf information, uh, how, what was the duration of developing leprosy in mice after the, after the in inoculation? Well, do you know, if it is an immunocompromised mice, you, you develop something like a, a lepromatous end of the spectrum. It will not be LL form, but it will be a more on the lepromatous, so that because when you take the tissues out, yeah. Uh, uh, there will be like lepra bacilli there. Okay. So to these mice now, I was giving infusion of T cells uh, taken from uh, the mouse, uh, healthy mouse, uh, and these T cells will come from the thoracic duct cannulation. Now, that was a big sort of uh, uh, job to do. How to do cannulation of the thoracic duct? And we were doing uh, the mouse anatomy is very similar to that of humans. So we were doing that cisterna chylae, as you know, in the abdominal part of the uh, of the duct. Yes. And uh, feed the mouse first with the uh, olive oil and uh, all that fatty. I used to feed through the uh, you know the the uh, duct, mm. uh, gastric root. So it, it was a tough. Work. I don't know why my boss gave me this kind of a tough work, but I, <laughs> I did it really. And that was what I think took me to the next stage then, and that I could uh, do that. That was a time when I was very keen in 1975. I was very keen now to do a postdoc somewhere. Hmm. But you know, by the time I had already published, and I'll show you. Uh, that the, the, that the work that because I was going to Vubarda, uh and taking patients of leprosy from there. So the, the next slide shows you my first real rendezvous with the lymphocyte, and this was a WHO immunology training course in Singapore. This was for three months. Mm -hmm. You know that kind of a course, and this is me and Malcolm Simons. He is unfortunately no more now. He was a New Zealander, a New Zealander Australian, but uh, he was the director of this center. And uh, out of many applications, I was selected for this particular course. And I was three months over there, and the, and the WHO fellowship was handsome money. And of course, it was a cheaper place in Singapore, but wonderful. And Texas, where 
my uh, love for lymphocyte be began. I learned a bit of, but you know, the, what, what we knew about immunology at the time, nothing. We were only, uh, we were only learning about um, uh, the morphology of the cells, uh, the only the, uh, the small lymphocyte, medium lymphocyte, large lymphocyte, lymphocytes make antibodies. Uh, this kind of things, you know, the uh, octoloni technique to look at the antibodies, something very preliminary things, you know, but it was a three month course. What happened in this three month course was 1972, I'm talking about. That was the time people had in the West started doing HLA typing by serology based test. And the sera were given by the National Institutes of Health, NIH. I had no idea. You know, we were about a batch of about 20 in this course, and I was the youngest of the lot. Mm -hmm. uh, Malcolm used to say he's the, he's the, he's the, he's the uh, what do you call, uh, I, I won't use the word brightest of the lot, but I was uh, the most awakened student of the lot. <laughs> and the last week of the course, Malcolm was doing some things in his office. He had made his office into a lab and they were doing this micro lymphocytotoxicity test. Mm. My first glimpse of the my this is me, of course, we used to work in the lab, yeah. people from Philippines, and these were my colleagues, these were much older than me. And, uh, and one woman, from, of course, from Chandigarh, this is from, uh, I think, Indonesia, or Philippines, all of those people, because this was a WHO course. This is uh, Dr. Sisinga Bibidingham. She also came from uh, Walter Liza Hall in Melbourne, and she used to show us the immunofluorescence at that time. So this is a fluorescence microscope, which we had never seen in India, you know, I mean. So for us, even that course was something very, very new. Very, very new. But in the last week, this guy, Malcolm, in his office was secretly doing this test. And I, as I told you that they always talked, I thought that I'm the naughtiest of the lot. Mm -hmm. And I from the window, what is he doing? He said, why are you looking at us? I said, but I want to know, what are you guys doing? You people are not showing this test to us. He said, no, no, this is, this is, uh, this is not part of the course. I said, but I want to see it. So I just, uh, you know, uh, sort of banged the door and I went inside. And they said, we are doing the micro lymphocytotoxicity test. So what was the test? They had this micro test trace. You need a Hamilton syringe. And they had the, at that time, the inverted phase contrast microscope, which I didn't have. I had this microscope in India. So I, this is 1972, I saw that. This stayed in my mind that they, that they were doing a test called micro lymphocytotoxicity test. Mm -hmm. And I was exploring this even more. Somebody said, write to National Institutes of Health. I wrote to NIH. I said, I want to study genetics of leprosy and looking at this immune response gene, the HLA system, I, I understand HLA system is, uh, is the one which presents the peptides so therefore it will look into the immune response uh, kind of genes, the genes control. So I, and they sent me sera. They sent me the sera. This was only A locus and B locus were known at that time. Mm. Only maybe eight or 10 antigens as we used to call at that time of A, HLA A and about 15 to 20 of HLA B. But they were very kind enough uh, to send me as a student, you know, my, uh, but maybe due to enthusiasm. And now my problem was it didn't, it didn't have the micro test tray. This tray was lit, uh, I mean, called at the time uh, Terasaki tray, because Terasaki, you know, 1964 devised this tray when the HLA system was known in 58, and you know, the very first international histocompatibility workshop was done in 1964 by uh, Bernie Amos in Durham, in North, North Carolina. And uh, Tarasaki was a young, uh, energetic uh, Japanese origin scientist in US. And you know, he had the Japanese instinct of uh, miniaturizing the test. 
So he miniaturized the test and created this uh, 72 well. This was at that time the 60 well tray, but then became 72, 96 well e e even. But this was a brilliant thing done. That now you could take one microliter of lymphocytes, about 2,000 cells, one microliter of the serum, that you know, the monospecific serum defining a particular HLA specificity, and five microliters of the complement, a rabbit complement, or you could take the human complement, human AB serum. But people used to take most of the, uh, and even now, and then it stayed for a long time, a rabbit complement, and then stain with the uh, ELCNY dye. And you could see under the microscope. And if you are the inverted microscope, you need, of course, the inverted microscope, because then you can see from below and you can score the reactions. And that's how you were doing the HLA typing, the serology based two stage micro lymphocytotoxicity test. Now, I got all of this. I don't know from where I got the micro serum, I must have stolen from somewhere. <laughs> and, um, and that is what, when I went in 1974 to Varda. Now I made a plan to sort of get those uh, samples from there. The samples were coming and we were doing HLA typing. Didn't have the micro, I had this microscope, the monocular microscope. It was not inverted. So how do I score the reactions? So I used to do this test and then flick the tray, you know, and many times these years and I would be on my lab coat. And then I used to score and I did that. This was a study done in 1974-75 or something, published in 75. This was my passion, my first publication in the area of HLA. In 1975, tissue antigens, which the journal is now called HLA, it, the name has been changed, but it was a tissue in the only journal. And look at the volume five. Mm. So I was right on the top, right at that time when the journal was made. And to tell you the truth, in 2018, we were in San Francisco for the 17th International Histocompatibility Workshop, where they were to decide the site for the next workshop. You know, as you know, the whole field of HLA has developed because of the International Histocompatibility Workshops. Yes. And they are done in three to four years either once in three years or mostly four years, one, once in four years now. So the 17th was being done over there in, um, in San Francisco in 2018, uh, I think 18, in 21 or 22 was to be done. And I also made a bid, I said, maybe why not we do it in India? And of course it didn't come to me, it went to the Dutch people, Holland. Uh, but I made a statement in that hall, I said, leaving aside Walter Bodmer in this room, Walter was there, you know, Sir Walter Bodmer, and Walter Bodmer and his wife, Julia. These are the people who had impressed me in 70s and 80s, and I'll come, come on that also. So I said, leaving him, tell me who else has a paper on HLA. I am, I, I'm on my paper is in 75, and I told people at that time, I said, I don't know whether what I'm showing you is right or wrong. If the data in this paper is right or wrong, I have no idea because none of us in this are, are trained, but we could do that. So that was my first paper. My second paper was, there used to be this journal called Microbiome. That's again, it was in 1975. So these were the first publications in the area of HLA. And I'm very proud of the fact that they came out in 1975. And now today there are very few people, people and you look at the Gandhi Memorial Epilepsy Foundation. Yes, I can see that, yeah. For the, That's a good no. achievement, yes, I think this is a, uh, really, it, really commendable. At that time you don't realize this, uh, you know, it was a very tough work of course to do. Mm. So 1976, now comes my major entry into the area of HLA. Uh, of course, uh, well, I don't know whether I have that slide, no. Uh, uh, no, oh, I'm sorry. I, I had a slide. 1976, June 1976, Dosset, Jean Dosset, the French scientist who ultimately got Nobel Prize, the Nobel Prize was given in 1980. Dosset, because by the time in 1974-75, the work of Rolf Zinkernagel and Doherty 
proved that the MSC or the HLA system in man, its major biological function is that of presenting the peptides to the immune system. So there is a genetic control of the immune response because depending on the kind of HLA antigens or genes that you have, you, your ability to pre 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 present that peptide. So this is actually the major biological function. So in 1973, Bruton in UK, London, I think he made a, what I would call Tahalka. He created sensation around the world when he showed for the first time that HLA B27, because at that time, very few uh, alleles, now we call alleles, we used to call them as HLA antigen at that time. HLA A and B and C locus are not known at all, and D, no, nobody knew HLA D locus. So he showed that HLA B27 is significantly associated with uh, ankylosing spondylitis. That's yeah. the first came in 1973, Bruton. That was a sensation. So people now thought the HLA system was developed a priori as a requirement for organ transplantation or bone marrow transplantation, selection of a donor. But here the first time showed it would also have a role in disease association. So that was 73 and that is why I started working in 74 on foia five leprosy. So you know, so I, I'm saying that even though I'm, I was in the third world in this uh, developing country with nobody to, people used to laugh at me. What are you doing? What is it? I said that you're talking about. They thought I'm talking with a Gila sub, you know, cell line. You know, that, that is the sign that they have. <laughs> I think Bruton's work really must have uh, impressed me in one way or the other. And uh, I, I had this paper and now, Dossier did this international symposium, the first international symposium on HLA and disease, organized by Dossier in Paris in 1976. Mm -hmm. I, you know, those days you, uh, the information will come to you very late and all that, but I was very keen to go there. Mm -hmm. I said I must go. I went to the director of the institute. The director was at that time Dr. Ramlinga Swami. He was a very big man, a very uh, very helpful. I must say that uh, as a student also he used to mark me. He had known my name. So he used to call me by my first name, Narendra, Naren or Narendra. So I said, sir, there is a, this symposium, a, a first international symposium on HLN disease. I want to go there. I have no money. He said, okay, but what we can do is I will ask the British Council. The British Council used to really, uh, you know, regard Ramalinga Swami a lot. So the plan was made, I will go to Paris, British Council will support me also for, because after this uh, conference, I would go to Britain and spend about two to three months time. And that's the time when I spent time in Mill Hill, a, a few weeks and a few weeks in uh, Oxford with the uh, Peter Momoris group. And you know, I must say I, that time I was lost flabbergasted with the kind of things that I saw in Mill Hill or in, uh, or I thought I am actually in the wrong track. I don't know when will I get such kind of things at all uh, ever. So in 76 was a landmark year. So I went there to this uh, conference. It was in uh, uh, Palladi Congress. I had first time seen that huge Congress center, you know, Palladi Congress in Paris and where my poster was accepted, I had a poster there on HLA antigens and leprosy. And, um, and I saw at that time all those big names, Dosse, uh, 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 <coughs> from Holland, uh, um, Rose Payne from the US, um, a lot of uh, Kissmeyer Nelson, um, Tarasaki and uh, Bernie Amos and all of those people, I thought that they were they were like gods, demigods moving around. Now I wanted to move behind some of them that they, they, they can give me an opportunity to do post-op with them. I, 
I was sure I'm not going to get anything of this sort, a kind of a lab in India. So I was uh, going after Terasaki because the Terasaki trained. I wanted to do with Terasaki, but he will not even talk to me. So anyway, this uh, poster was there and one, this Dutch man came to me, uh, <coughs> Rene de Vries. Rene de Vries was a PhD student in, in Leiden, Holland under Jan van Roed. Now, Jan van Roed and Dosse were contenders for the Nobel Prize. Uh, because one had shown this in, uh, in transfused individuals and uh, Dosse uh, showed in transfused individuals and, and uh, Jan van Roed, of course, in pregnant women. Of course, the impact of the pregnant women, Sira, was felt for many, many years to come. So, Rane came to me and said, oh, you've done work on leprosy? I said, yes. He said, we have also done work on leprosy. You know, the, the Dutch colony Suriname. So they were getting patients of leprosy from Suriname. They had some, done some family studies and I went to see their poster. I did not, to tell you the truth, I did not understand their study. Because for me, the kind of uh, uh, statistical uh, data that they are used, I, had, I, I couldn't understand. But he told me, tomorrow at this time, Jan will come to talk to you about your poster. Jan will rule. Now, Devinder, I could not sleep that night. <laughs> because he was a, a, a contender for the Nobel Prize. <laughs> I knew when he comes tomorrow, what will I say? <laughs> I have, I have uh, stolen the bloody microscope. I, I had no microscope even. And nobody, whether the data that is published is correct or not, even that, I don't know. And I even now say that. Anyway, Jan came and he said, oh, very nice. Did you do this study in India? I said, yes. Who trained you? I said, nobody. <laughs> I just learned, I learned from so how did you do? I said, I just wrote to NIH and this, this, this serum bank and they sent me some sera. I don't have a microscope. Uh, so I flicked the trays and I did that. I think that attracted him. So he told me and I thought, uh, you know, I thought I will not be able to go to Holland to do my postdoc because the language, language issue, you know. Hmm. But he said, uh, would you like to collaborate with us? Have you seen, we are also doing studies on leprosy in Suriname, but we are very keen to do studies in India. So would you, would you like to collaborate? No, that was as a, as a young man, it was like a bolt from the blue from a guy who is like a dummy <laughs> is asking me to collaborate with him. <laughs> so that issue of my postdoc went off from my mind. I said, yes, but, uh, I need something. He said, what? I said, you need to train me first. And I, at that time, you know, I must say that a thought came to me that I should hide from him because, you know, actually you come from a third world country, poor country, and you know what was the condition in 70s and all that. Uh, so I, one, one part of my brain was saying I should hide everything. The other said, no, no, speak the truth. He is a big man. I told him, these papers are in print, but I do not know whatever is done is correct or not. I do nobody has trained me actually typing, and nobody has named me even how to calculate the data. But it is published, so I think those kind of things. So he said, "When are you going to India?" I think in about two days' time I was going. He said, "No, no." He just made a statement. No, no, you're not going. You come with us to Leiden. <laughs> no, he said this in the event, and I. Then I told this Rane, I said, look, Rane, I have bought a very cheap ticket. The air, you know, the, it was from the Ariana Afghan airline at the time. The cheapest <laughs> I said, they are not going to change my flight. So how do I then go back? So even he didn't have the guts to talk. He said, look, I mean, as I know, Yon, once he has said you come, you better come. And then Yon met me and he said, you know, you are coming with me in the car. So because they had driven from uh, Holland, uh, you know, to, to Paris. So I then traveled with him in the car but for three hours, a four hour journey. I think that changed my whole attitude. And when I went to their lab, huge lab, and you know, I had bloody one small little room where I was doing all this bloody uh, test and all. 
And uh, that really, I mean, couldn't believe that. This is what the science is. And in, it was then drawing, drawing me even more into it. And then we developed collaboration. This was in June and Yon came to India in October, I think, and I took him to Varda. He was so fascinated by Gandhi's life. He, he really sat there and, you know, praying towards Gandhi's photographs and all that. And particularly the picture of Gandhi treating a patient of leprosy. Yeah. Shastri. Mm -hmm. This is really attractive. But the only thing I remember that he told me, because, you know, everywhere in India, he would see that swastika sign, you know, that swastika sign, that Om, yes, yeah. the swastika sign we have. And they had, uh, you know, in the war, the word was the yeah. sign was the German sign, the German uh, mm. Hitler sign. He said, why is there this sign everywhere I go and see? I said, this is from Sanskrit. This is, uh, this is the most pious. But the but the sign that Hitler used is not this not the same because we you know that that cross and then we have that uh, towards the end like this so he he was very fa fa fascinated mm -hmm. and uh, we then went to the Gandhi Memorial Leprosy Foundation talked to them there was no lab over there he had some money so he said I will put the AC the air conditioning I mean those time those days even air conditioner in the room and. How and then we planned that the run to the run of the students were part of his this is work. So he then came over in nineteen seventy-seven to to Delhi uh, to India and we spent about two months in Varda collecting leprosy families. Our our issue was to collect leprosy families of the type that I told him that I saw families where two children, three children are affected and others are healthy. So that's the kind of families we are looking for. Yes. Because under the same environment, you look at the haplotypes being transmitted from the parental to the, and then you want to see the random or the non random segregation of the haplotypes. So this is something that I first time heard, and you know, uh, the statistical evaluation and all that. So those were papers, our, and then of course 77, uh, 76, 77, two times, and we have the three papers in Journal of Infectious Diseases. This is a landmark papers, first time demonstrating that there, that there is a HLA linked gene. You know, the in Bruton showed in 73 association of HLA B27. And here we were seeing linkage. Yes. Link only show through the family studies, the multiple case family studies. So this was something that I first time learned and then I uh, understood very well. If you want to show a linkage of a gene that you can only show in family studies and you should have correct kind of families uh, selected for the purpose actually. There should be at least, uh, these are called the multi-case affected families. Two children at least affected with the disease and there should be a couple of children, preferably help, uh, elder to these two affected kids. And for comparison, because they would have escaped that haplotype, either coming from the mother or the father, and they therefore did not have developed leprosy. These are the younger kids uh, who, who developed leprosy and they had inherited that. So you do that non-random segregation analysis and uh, Forget the name of the test, the statistical test that we're using at that time. And these papers were published in Journal of Infectious Diseases, the top most journal at the time. And we repeated this study in 1977. Now, here I should tell you a story. In 19, Rene DeVries came in 76. That time, we were transporting all the blood samples down from Varda. We send, we will come by car to Nagpur to, and then I will fly with those blood samples from Nagpur to Delhi and on the same night they were being shipped to Holland to, to, uh, to, to, to Leiden there and they would uh, over there the technician would separate out the lymphocytes and freeze those, freeze those and keep it in the freezer at the time. And then I went back in um, 
in uh, April of 77 and I did the test on those. So that was what. But by the next year, by 1977, we had made a plan that we will not do this kind of, you know, so there, there were no ethics, so there was no binding on us to send the biological material out. Now we have all those bindings. That time we didn't have. In 1977, we had by that time learned that we will collect these samples from these leprosy families and separate out the lymphocytes in the lab that we created in Mubarda, freeze them right over there. So we used to get the dry eyes. The dry eyes was not available in Mubarda or in Nagpur. So I used to get dry eyes from Delhi. So Delhi, it will come in thermocall boxes and uh, to this, uh, uh, you know, the uh, rudimentary lab that we had made in Mubarda. We were storing these. So, uh, what what was happening was rather than on that particular one particular day we collect 15 20 samples and rush towards delhi and then ship it to holland here we could work, do the work for one week store all these samples in dry eyes and now take that packet of dry eyes by air to delhi and then ship it to holland uh, for, for, for really doing the test this is what we were doing now, one week, so, you know, it was a very tough work. Uh, in 76, as you know, at that time, India had the emergency. Uh, uh, and I want to tell you this story, uh, both of 76 and 77. These are very important stories and part of my career. In 76, Rene de Vries, who had come from Holland, and we stayed in that guest house of the Gandhi Memorial Leprosy Foundation, a uh, very Gandhian kind of a life, simple life, totally <laughs> vegetarian and uh, really very simple life. And uh, we used to go early in the morning around 5.30 a.m. or 6 a.m. to the leprosy family houses because otherwise they will go away. And then the, our aim was to collect the whole family, including the healthy sips. Otherwise, they used to leave for their fields. And we will not get the whole bank. We need to have, to have also the both the parents there, the mother and the father. Otherwise, we will not be able to derive the haplotypes. So it was very tough, very tough study. So we, we used to go very early. And one time, Devries wore the kurta ayama khadi, and we used to go on the bicycle. And you know, his age and his uh, uh, hey, you know, he was a little bored from that side. He looked exactly like Sanjay Gandhi. <laughs> when we were going the bicycles, you know, one fine morning, at their time we used to go in our trousers, but then we bought this uh, kurta pajama khadi uh, from their local market, and we wore that and went there. Now the people thought that this is Sanjay Gandhi coming from far they thought. He would close the doors, you know, no would open the door. That was Sanjay And we didn't get any samples that day. Because emergency uh, fear. I mean, did this guy looks like that? Ask him to wear, you know, then ask him to wear a shirt and maybe a tie. That they, you know, this is simple people, the, the village folks. And if you tell them that there is a doctor also has come from outside of India and we are all working on leprosy, then they would, uh, you know, agree to give samples and all that. So, so that was the one story that I remember. But in the next year, when we were collecting samples for a week and storing in dry ice, that was a big story. We had that rudimentary lab, which we had made in conditioning. So we would collect maybe about 15 to 20 samples every day. And then we had to separate out the lymphocytes, you know, in the lab over there. And we had a a very uh, prelim uh, I mean, pre preliminary kind of a centrifuge, a primary centrifuge that we had, and uh, lymphoprep and separate out the lymphocyte, the mononuclear cell layer, freeze them. So it was a huge work. So one that we would get up in the morning at five o'clock, we would come back with the samples maybe by 12 or 11, 12. Immediately we have to work because it would take us about four hours or so. Then by four or five o'clock, we have to rush 
to the airport in Nagpur, which would be about a year, a, a, an hour and a half uh, on a broken road. Uh, and because the flight will go away at that time, they, they, there were no carriers, they, they, there were no couriers of, of that time. We had to do it on our own. Yes, yeah. And, uh, uh, and you know, the, it used to be so much a tough work. And this Dutch man, now the next second year, the Guy who came was his name of Willem Willem Faneden. Willem Faneden might be somewhere. Uh, there may be in my some of the papers. I might have his name somewhere. Yeah, this is Willem Faneden, and of uh, Van Roots. Uh, this was in t tissue antigens, but then we had in seventy nine other paper. I just wanted to show you the name. So Willem and I used to work on the bench in that Varda lab and um, the, uh, because we used to get tired and you know in the guest house we used to eat vegetarian food so I think we were exhausted maybe well we used to work for five days at a stretch and collect all the samples and then those had to be shipped and very tough work this guy when we were working one afternoon used to be hot outside of course and he had not taken any beer for maybe <laughs> you know, 10 days or 15 days and no non-veg food. It was all vegetarian food. <laughs> I heard, I used to work on the left side of the bench. He was on the right side. And we didn't even have the time to even talk to each other because we were so busy with each other's work. <laughs> I heard a sound, a third sound. He, he really fell on the ground. He was unconscious. And I was uh, worried, you know, he's unconscious. What do we do? I threw water on his face and all that. Anyway, he got re re revived. So that evening, we did not send samples out. That evening, uh, we went to Nagpur. Nagpur is a big city. And we went to a restaurant. We ate the chicken, the tan tan tandoori chicken, and had some beer. So that's that beer and the tandoori chicken will stay in. <laughs> for many years so we revived this guy and so those are part of the story yeah. only to tell you the truth that it was so tough life at the yeah. time yeah. now this was happening and then uh, you know i i got the dutch grant actually and uh, only 300 rupees was the travel fare by air between nagpur to delhi and i must have traveled about 100 times up and down uh, between delhi nagpur and all that then we organized you know first training course on hla in aims in delhi now look at this we ourselves were not trained and we were doing the whole aim was doing who training course we did two of them this used to be my boss is unfortunately no more his name is dr mahesh mugaida actually he was in department of anatomy but very interesting he was the one who had spent two years in oxford on that leprosy model. So we became like not a teacher uh, or a pupil, but more like a father son team, you know, and very nice guy. And the whole purpose was to get some money from WHO so that we could buy some microscope or some other reagent. But there was no money in India otherwise. And this is the uh, you know the training go this is hilliard festenstein he was from london he was very impressive i was very impressed by him this is eric thosby he's still alive hilliard is dead of course eric thosby was from norway they came in 1977 course i was so impressed by uh, um, uh, eric thosby a fantastic guy and you know some of the hla antigens have been have become known only because of these guys. You know, this actually B12 was named afterwards. For many years, it used to be called HLA ET. ET is from Eric Thosby. And Eric actually had got himself immunized with lymphocytes of somebody who had probably HLA B12. And that's how the B12 specificity came, came to be known because he developed a serum for that. He he could have even died. I mean, you know. You take a shot of 
lymphocytes from a third party individuals the pure cell pure lymphocytes so you could create a, 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 a reaction but these are the kind of people we had uh, and uh, this is 1977 uh, and i was uh, over there there were people from bangkok and i with that money i got bought the microscope this was bought in 19 i think 77 or 78 now I had the inverted face contrast microscope. You can see the glee on my face. It was a prize position. It stayed with us for all these years. Even when I retired from the department, the department still has this microscope. It was like a horse that we had. So now we could, rather than flicking the tray, I could do the HLA typing serology bit uh, through the, so with that money, we were buying this and that's how <laughs> things were moving. This is a Jovan Van Rood, uh, you know, that in 76 when he came to me. And this is much, much afterwards, mm -hmm. his picture. But he, uh, I must pay tributes to him. He is also dead now. Uh, but he used to call me almost every summer in, uh, in Holland. Uh, I, I must have gone at least two, three, four years. Uh, summertime. summertime used to be really great. And he had the boat himself, his, his own boat. And he used to do science at sea you know used to go take people uh, on the boat and used to also call some people from us and other you know really good people and we used to when we go to the boat we used to have three to four hours of scientific sessions and then after that of course the drinks and the beer and uh, wine and all that so <laughs> learned so much from him <laughs> Let's watch on the boat and uh, the, uh, that was the time, even then, there was nothing in India. So, so I must say that, that the, my dream of doing a postdoc in the 70s was, was dashed because of this. I didn't go anywhere. I must have gone for one month, two months here and there uh, to various labs in uh, U U Europe even. And when I was in Van Roo, in Van Roo in 76, 77, 70 year, I must have been going every year. Uh, and uh, a, lot, a lot of my Dutch friends used to feel that uh, Dion calls you every summer and then he also takes you on the boat and he doesn't take us. <laughs> so, so, so I, Lorenzo, I mean, it's just I think because of time to tell, yeah. uh, just share about your uh, uh, the transplantation. Uh, so from this uh, weekend, my journey continued. To this is the transplantation and your, your major input in, in India. I think that's what people remember yeah. acknowledge you and um, being the father of the transplantation medicine. Sure. So I started with really in infections, so from le leprosy to TB to other diseases now, hepatotoxicity, and TB, and uh, uh, now diabetes, HIV. Uh, and these were all disease, 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 disease. Australia connection. We made, we made our uh, uh, association in uh, Asia Oceania, and uh, this and my association with the Australian connection. This was very, very helpful at that time, including people like Gus Nossel and Jim McCluskey and Peter Doherty. These are the people that I was interacting with and uh, um, learning. Uh, because there was, since there was nobody here in India, I used to really enjoy these uh, seminars, very high intensity seminars that we used to have. Yes. Uh, Roger was a big guy in Australia, and uh, this is in his form. Then I got in touch with people from Japan. And that was a time in 77, uh, uh, this is for 1993, Dosse. Jan Dosse came to us in, uh, he's sitting actually on, on my chair uh, yeah. in, in my office. And I can like, see that, yes. Uh, in mid 70s, there was a lot of interest in um, institute to do organ transplant, the kidney transplantation there. And uh, Dr. Dhawan in, in surgery and Dr. Uh, Malotra, his boss, he's a, he's in, in, in a, in a nephrologist as well. But his boss, they were very keen to do that. And they had known that I was doing HLA typing. So they actually went to the director of the institute and created a special job for me as lecturer in HLA lab. 
So that's how the HLA lab, HLA lab was established formally and I was inducted as a lecturer because that time it was on your start point was a lecturer. And by 1993, I created the Department of Transplant Immunology and Immunology Genetics. Uh, because, uh, and of course, my students at that time, in, uh, um, when, when Dossier came, they, they are all doing very well, all, all, all of them. And in, in 1980s, this is the time then I really spent uh, about 16 months at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center and learned the, the, this was the time when molecular typing was just beginning to come up. And the Fred Hutchinson Center, as you know, the top <coughs> center you know, in the field of bone marrow transplantation. So I had already started doing HLA typing for donor selection for kidney transplantation by 78, 79, 80s. And uh, uh, Jan Van Rood helped me because he had created Eurotransplant in Holland and he would give me the serum set, all the serum set, and with that set, I and so the transplant, the organ transplant activity picked up in India, it picked up first in Ames and then, of course, in India. And now I wanted to go to the next level to see what, what is happening in the bone marrow field of bone marrow transplantation. The PCR RFLP was the major theme of the 10th International History Compatibility Workshop, and I learned for the first time over there no idea how to because 1986 as you know is the year when um, the ecr became very common polymer chain reaction uh, carry molly's work and uh, this was a, a very important uh, step in my life that i spent this 16 months and they were very keen that i should stay back but i i had the bug i must go back to india establish all of these molecular techniques over there. So I don't know whether I did the right thing of coming back to India or I should have stayed back in the US or anyway, the destiny takes you wherever you want to. But then from there on started my interaction with the top guys around the world. Terasaki, you know, uh, he would come to me. I mean, people, I must say, these are the people, they were real scientists. They would encourage somebody from a third world country and you know Tarasaki then came number of times to me. this is in my house and uh, you know my wife there and uh, and talking about um, his experience and how things have to move this was 1988 again molecular way of typing was not as much established at that time and then of course um, my associate we were moving towards creating a Asia Oceania History Compatibility uh, Association. So Japanese were very, very good in that. So we had, so I had a lot of connections. So I was traveling all the time, you know. This is Eric Thosby, as I showed you in 76. He, he really must have impressed me the most. A very brilliant scientist and uh, clear, clarity of thought that I saw, that I heard from Eric. I had not heard from anybody else. So, and then I started doing my own symposia <clears throat> that I did in 1993. This was the one which was helping me now to improve my lab activity, uh, both in uh, transplant field as well as in uh, disease associated, because I had many students. Living in Ames was a boon to me because almost every department, every specialty department was keen to work with me. So, you know, uh, and therefore, by, that, by 1993, I created a separate department. And I must say, uh, it, is a, it is a historic move because creating a separate department in Ames and from a single man was not an easy job. It, I went through a lot of uh, tough time. But 93 is the one when I became a full of officer. And... Um, on the way between this time, I must have achieved a lot in terms of academic recognition. And I'll show you slides where I got all the awards, all the highest awards for science. And today I can say that I got all the highest awards for science that India can give, that India could give at that time. All the highest awards for science from ICMR and you know, the CSIR and a lot of international recognition. But that, that comes to you as you move forward. So I. My idea was that my students must 
interact with the, the international stars uh, of all these years. And that's how we were doing a number of symbols. Yeah, this is Bert Feldkamp from uh, Holland. Again, like, uh, uh, like Bruton, Bert Feldkamp was a big name in rheumatology and HLA-27 and uh, DR4 and RA. So uh, 98 was another landmark year in our life because we were doing the 10th International Congress of Immunology and I was the vice chair of the Congress and spent huge number of uh, my months and hours doing it. And at that time I also did the, this workshop, uh, the Tissue Typing Association of Asia Oceania and the first time we did it in India. And this was along with the International Congress, uh, you know. So these were all, and then number of my students and associates, I put only a few names. This is one guy, Rajalingam, I'm very proud of him because he was uh, really very, very good, very hardworking chap. He came to me from Chennai and uh, really some, somebody who did not know anything, but very hardworking and keen to learn today. He is the director of the histocompatibility lab in the uh, San Francisco, in the University of California, San Francisco, doing very well. He's the one who did uh, work with uh, Peter Pepperham on KIR molecules. So the KIR molecules he is the star. Rajalingam is the star. He's now the full, full chair over there also. And our publications went up in, so from uh, infection, I was moving with uh, Anand Malviya. I'm sure you know Anand Malviya. He's also from now. So with Malviya, I must have at least 80 to 100 papers on various, various uh, we, we described for the first time unclassifiable seronegative spondyloarthropathies, the P27 associated. And this is now called the undifferentiated SSA. So, uh, so both in the transplant field. Now I was moving more in the rheumatology field. Malvia eventually left the institute in 1996 or 97. And I think that was the end of uh, my journey in rheumatology. And that drew me more towards the transplant field then. Uh, they were all kinds of papers then type 1 diabetes. And you know, because as the field was growing, uh, in various uh, diseases, so I was also, you know, attracted to that. So, apart from the transplant, I have contributions in almost every disease, even rheumatic heart disease. And my other landmark is that in 2010, then I had published this book, HLA Complex in Medicine Biology. Uh, we made this point because that was the year when I was turning 60. And uh, I was thinking that why not do the book? And even now this stands as the only book on HLA complex and medicine and biology. I still have a few copies left. And uh, this was my student who became an assistant editor with me and I had advisory editors and uh, from Jim McCluskey from Australia. Frank was also from Australia. Franz Klaas is a student of uh, 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 Jan van, 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 van Root, a very prominent scientist now around the world. And there was a foreword also by Peter Doherty by Lord. I'm very proud of this book. Uh, and then, of course, uh, my plan was to create a National Institute of Molecular and Transplant Immunology in India. That dream has not uh, yet come through. Uh, because it's not that easy to create all these things in India. And uh, I wanted to create the National Marrow Donor Registry in India for the unrelated marrow transplant, the marrow, un marrow unrelated donor transplants. So this, this is the, something that I wanted to show you, but then I, uh, these are people who must have impressed me. David Baltimore used a couple of times the games uh, to India, and I, I'm very fond of showing this slide to a lot of people that he made a statement. This is in '75, and he uh, this was in 2007. He got, got the Nobel Prize in '75. He said, "Doing science at the highest possible level is one of the greatest forms of fun as they can be in this world. You get paid for it. People appreciate you for it. You contribute to society. 
And in my view, you just can't beat it. I'll be 70 years old next year, and I still have a love, a new results as I ever did. That's it is the greatest high I know. That, that's true, 100% true. I think, that's, I think that's the driving force I think we all need, you know. This is the driving force. You know, I made this because it, 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 as if it is my own life. You know, because I, 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 say, I say I have the same view. I tell my colleagues and my children also about that. You know, I'm lucky I've been paid for it. And yes. So it's not that uh, I've done it. I've, I've done it a part of my job, you know. And like, many people used to call me eccentric in the very beginning. And they oh, yeah. just be really fooled when you waste your life. <laughs> In the in the institute in Ames, people you my, my seniors used to call me H, H, HLA Mehra actually, you know, HLA Mehra and um, <laughs> father of HLA in India. So all those kind of names. That's, that's name. a compliment, actually. That's a compliment, in the yes. Yeah. Uh, and then I had this book again in 2017. Frontiers in Immunology approached me that. Uh, you know, why don't we write on antibody repertoire and graft outcome following solid organ transplantation? Mm. This is a remarkable book. And uh, you mentioned that I remember this. this really yeah, a I, I, this, uh, I can send soft copies of this to you also again. Again, this is on totally on uh, antibodies in organ transplantation. And my, I will only end by showing you some of the prominent awards. As I said, I must have have more than 100 awards, uh, almost all the highest awards for science that India. The highest award in India is the SS Bhatnagar Prize. Uh, I got it in way back in 1992 because it, this award is given to people below 45 and I was probably 42 at that time, considered the highest award and they, they call us Bhatnagar laureates. You know? <laughs> so you, you go I next to this award and actually it's, it's different. Mainly for science uh, people, not for medicine people. No, no, it is for medicine also. This is for seven sciences. You see this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is me seven. medicine. Oh, medicine, All of course, yes. All branches of science uh, physics, chemistry, mathematics, uh, oceanography, space research. And in the center, it is the medicine. medicine. Yeah, yeah. That, yes. Okay. Yeah. And now I sit on the board to sort of select the people for the award. The other big award that I had, the Renbakshi Science Foundation, you came in that. Yes, maybe. I that was As, a great honor. You you gave it to me. I became chief uh, chief guest or guest know, visiting. Yes. And the Renbakshi Science Awards, because I got that in 1996, and after that, I was a part of the jury for many, many. So now, Dan Bekshi, because it was bought over, now it is uh, the Sun Pharma. Well, it, the, 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 the present, uh, present chair, I said, uh, Dr. Chauhan, I think. Yeah. We, we, he, he has been in touch with me. So, um, I, I don't Dr. know what is the plan. So that, the, 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 the foundation has got the name now Sun Pharma. Because Sun Pharma. Then, and then this is the B.R. Ambedkar Award. Of course, I got all the awards from ICMR, mm. but this is the highest award of ICMR. And I got that as well in 2011. Earlier, I got several awards of ICMR. Mm. <laughs> the International Union of Immunological Societies. So in one hand, I was uh, you know, getting recognized in the immunogenetics field and my own HLA field, but immunology as well. And uh, I was council member of the IOIS, the IOIS is the International Union of Immunological Societies. I was recalled four terms as council member. So I was 12 years over there and then they made me chair of the Gender Equality and Career Development. And I was there for 10 years. In 2019, they said bye-bye to me now. And now I have spent too much of time. Yeah, I'm looking at this one. I mean, I'm, I'm really surprised why somebody did not really rec nominate you for uh, for the Royal Society FRS. I don't know, and I probably yeah, did. Is, I mean, as you know, I mean now these days, Wenke is a chair, is a president of FRS, the only Indian ever, only non yeah. non English ever to really hold that position. Again, the winter when I uh, creating a department, creating this. Uh, I must have also attracted a lot of enemies as well. 
Well, that's, that's that's part of the game. I mean, I'm, uh, I, I can, I, we can we can all talk about that when we have, we need to have a separate think, session to discuss that. You know, this slide to show you that I got elected into all the uh, fellowship uh, fellow of the Indian National Science Academy FNA. Well, uh, in, yeah, we we, we are corresponding on that. I, I got uh, elected very much of the World Academy of Science, the F to us. So that was the very first go I got that uh, F to us. So, uh, but uh, yeah, I should have. This is the Indian Society of Organ Transplantation. They uh, made me the fellow of their uh, society. The AFIA is the um, Asia Pacific Histocompatibility and Immunogenetics Association. They have, in, in terms in term of my contributions, they've given me AFIA life membership. Mm. Uh, you know, so I can attend any of their meetings. This is Khwarizmi International Award. Uh, this is from Iran. It came as a surprise to me one day. They, you know, this is in 99 or something. They wrote to me. I don't know how they got my email to send us uh, my, my CV, event my, send my CV to them. This is the Iranian Research Organization on Science and Technology. They gave me this award. This is their, their highest award. And uh, I think they gave me about six thousand or seven thousand dollars or something mm -hmm. along with that. Um, the French uh, government um, uh, they, they gave me the Cavalier of the National Order of Merit. So those are my highest awards. I can uh, I can. Yeah. Um, so, uh, is there something I, in it, in a related uh, subject of awards? I think uh, um, uh, some people take a lot of pride, although I've got doubt, I'm very doubtful about the criteria or the events leading to that award. So it's in India, for example, Padma Award and also in the UK, OB and CB and all those things. That's the only thing that I, hopefully someday my Padma will come. <laughs> Well, I think we have to work on it. I think we are now looking at now, I think, uh, yeah, certainly I think I have to make inquiries on that, how to really, I'll be, I'll be happy to uh, support. Uh, yeah. And I don't know, I think I'm not, not in the position to really do anything from outside, but certainly I think FRS is something that you deserve, which uh, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm fed up with things, but not like FRS. I think FRS is a very big thing in, in the in the world, actually, historically. You know. Well, Narendra, it's been very it's really the, 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 before we clo uh, close. Um, now, you, the, the, how do you see the future now in India of um, new science? Because I think uh, my, my passion is our genom genomic genomic medicine. I mean, I've done. The three books and uh, and the latest one, I don't know that you know that it's because I'm very keen on molecular medicine. As you can see, this is my latest book. Oh, yeah. yeah, and so this is my passion. And but I don't know. Many exactly. people in India talk about genomic uh, science, you know, me genomic medicine. Yeah. And recently, you know, this Vashvik uh, Vaganik, the Vaibhav Summit. You know, you might have known Modi's. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I was invited to be a panelist. Wow. So I was up on the panel on two sessions, one session with the IGIB and one session with Thangaraj on mm. precision medicine, you know, therapeutic genomics and the precision diagnostic genomics and all those. So I, I gave a brief presentation, but there were presentations from uh, USA also, some other scientists, and I was, Bit concerned because I think uh, I, I, I'm a clinician, so I really want to th see things happening at the patient yeah. level, at the clinical level. Like I mean, you have done, you have taken the science to the clinic, to the surgical theater. I think that's yeah. the way to look at it. Not like a, you, you, you left all your life in animals, you know, in the lab. Yeah, so that's, I think. So that's that's very important to to be practical, and uh, so I think that, so. How how do you see uh, people in India? I'm mean, the present day, a lot of excitement. Uh, Ayushman, Ayushman, and all those projects. 
that's a very important point that you are asking me. You remember when Sham Agarwal was still alive? Yeah. We were making plans that rather than medical genetics, India should have departments of genetic medicine. That's correct. That's what I'm, that's what I'm, precisely I'm after that. That's now we call genomic medicine. We can call it genomic yeah. medicine. So the, the, the ICMR, I think it was the Ganguly at that time, or even VM Atoj, created a task force, created an expert group. Uh, the Shama Global was there, I was also there. Ganguly. It was Ganguly's time. Ganguly's time, and, and we discussed at length, and we created a document that is a need to create the document. documents of genetic medicine. Yeah. You know, after that, it, it died, actually. And I'm, uh, you know, I, I am of the view, Hmm. Now, for example, when I started, you see that when I started in the 70s, I had no idea that one day I will create a department, uh, a separate department in Ames. I still feel in India things come up, but they may take years. Well, that, that's, that's normal. I think, that's, I think that applies to many countries. Yeah, I think so long, so long there is a vision, there is a, a correct approach. And uh, I mean, you know, my, my, my program, is, is called UK India Genomic Medicine Alliance. And yes. uh, so, I mean, there is a meeting next week uh, with the UK in DBT on the huge health data and bioinformatics, which I'm presenting my, my, my sort of algorithms and my ideas about the cardiovascular genomic medicine, which is my present field. I think uh, it's very important that uh, people like yourself and um, I think no, we have the document that we have discussed it at length, and I think it has to be taken up again. If yes. you uh, uh, next time after COVID goes, you come over and we can meet uh, Dr. Hashwatan, mm -hmm. uh, a friend also, and I can talk to him. Yeah, that they, that's very important. I mean, I'm. Uh, I mean, within this uh, program, uh, this uh, in, uh, life, life, uh, life achievement interviews, I'm also going to speak speak to Thangaraj, and uh, mm -hmm. of course, my old friend Ishwar Verma. And uh, Samir Brahmachari is, is very keen to really talk to me on this one. So I've got a few people lined up. And uh, so I, I'll get back to you if you could uh, suggest anybody else, you know, who might be uh, like, um, is Ganguly still around? So two things need to be developed in India. One that I'm saying genomic medicine departments and the other that document that I had submitted I think in, way back in 2012 to ICMR to create a national institute of technology where you could then I had submitted a document at that time called NIMTI National Institute of Molecular you know because or we need a we need a that's whole the whole idea of this new book is about uh, molecular medicine. That's right. See, if you look at uh, David Weatherall's work in Oxford, you know, he set up the institute, which is named after him now, called Weatherall Institute of Molecular Medicine. He was far ahead of his approach. And that's precisely happening now. Genomic medicine is part of the molecular medicine. It's, it should not be seen as separate. Absolutely. It's part, it's part of the molecular medicine. So that was the name that I gave in, two, uh, in two, 2010, but now, now, of course, I think with the development we need to. But what I'm saying is that there's a need for this kind of institutions in India. But, but in yeah, you're right, you're right. And, and there was thing at present, uh, when I go to India, there are many, for example, there's a National Institute of Immunology, there's a National Institute of Genetic Engineering, there's a National Institute of uh, Genomic Biology, and all those are fragmented. So they should be put together. Fragmented. And the, money is going with. Uh, the National Institute of Immunology was uh, established in these in the uh, 80s, and I was very much uh, associated with that. Unfortunately, over the years, it has become more of a National Institute of Cell Biology. There's very little, if at all, immunology being done over there. Cell biology. Yeah. More of like any other cell biology issue. People do all kinds of things over there. You know, here we need uh, we need clinical and experimental immunology you can say or translational immunology or transplant I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm an institute for trans translational immunology 
where everything will come under, you know, you're talking about rheumatology and uh, all other diseases, even cancer, and today immunology and everything. What, what, what is happening in COVID-19? I, I you know, I'm, I'm glad you sent me this email and now I see your mobile num num number. I have during the COVID time written extensively in the Hindustan Times. Well, you sent me one, uh, you sent me one newspaper clip, I, I've seen that. I have written nine of them and, and you know, it's easier for me to send it by WhatsApp. Yeah, so please, do that. please do that. Mobile of yours, which is 7766310291. That's correct. Also, WhatsApp, I will save this number and send you by WhatsApp my all of my nine articles that I wrote. Uh, my first article came in April 1. There's so much. Yeah. You know, when I was reviewing, I, I gave a lot of web webinars on COVID-19 and I will be very happy to give if you would arrange any. Well, I mean, any I'm, uh, this is the area, I mean, I, I mean I'm, I started a seminar series for my college, you know, my KGMU alumni seminars, uh, which basically for more general audience. And the COVID-19 is, is a theme. Include I'm telling people COVID-19 is a how to learn medicine in yes. reality. Yes. You know, the they, about, they, they don't know about herd immunity, they don't know about uh, uh, the epidemiology, they talk loosely. Everybody talking so loosely, and this so, is time to really to teach medical students and young doctors, other doctors, uh, the, the subject which you always hated and loved called social and preventive medicine. That is now time to remind. <laughs> yeah. That's yes. the most important subject. <laughs> there are forty-four thousand seven hundred articles published on COVID nineteen between March and September end. My goodness, four thousand seven hundred in the public and more than half of them are in the field of immunology well immunology is the base, is the basis infection and the body is fighting the infection and the host defense and all this is immunology that's the central thing basics the it's so wonderful and as you said uh, covid 19 is good so learn the innate and adaptive immunity this is a case of fantastic case of uh, how the innate and adaptive immunity are Correct. Yes, correct. Well, Narendra, it's been really delightful. I mean, it's a really pl privileged pleasure to really talk to you. I mean, I, I mean, you have taken uh, me to, to a very basic lab sciences. You 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 developed and practiced all your life, and then you went on to, which is my always been the, the purpose and message. Uh, unless the science becomes uh, amenable, accessible to common people, it has no purpose. I mean, that's what Gandhi also said. Yes. Gandhi said, you take the science to the common people in the villages. And he set the example. He was, uh, he treated the patient of leprosy. Yes. The viral everywhere, you know. And that, that, that other thing is that you use that center for developing science immunology of leprosy, yes. which you took that uh, the leprosy center to put international arena. So I'm sure yeah. Gandhi would have been very pleased. <laughs> well, so, so I think we have, you have to let it go back and you have, you yeah, see, your karva chauth and all those things, you know. Uh, my wife has the fast of karva chauth. We they should look for the moon and then eat. I think it must be getting time for your moon lighting there, moon, moon, moon seeing there. So I should not really hold on to you. Anyway, so nice meeting you. I will uh, edit that and put in the recording. And then as soon as you are aware, where you can uh, watch it and see it, you know. And you all my articles of COVID-19. Yeah. Okay, all the best. Thank you very much. It was great uh, talking to you. Thank okay. you so much. All right, thank you.